All right, so let's try this example. So we want the volume of a solid whose base is a semicircle, uh, semicircular disk, I should say, would be more accurate. Semi semicircle is just the perimeter. Semicircular disk, and whose cross sections perpendicular to the y axis are triangles with a height three times the base. So uh, centered at zero. Okay. All right, so we want the solid whose base is a semicircular disk centered at the origin. Uh, it still doesn't tell you enough. Anyway, I mean in the first and second quadrants. So I'm not going to keep changing it. We'll just draw the picture. There we go. Okay, so the picture would look like this. Okay, and then what's going to happen? So that's going to be the base of the solid. That's the bottom of it. And then this solid's going to then come like out at you because that, if that's the base of it, then it's going to come out at you. And then if you, any way you cut it uh, with uh, perpendicular to the y-axis, you get the shape of the triangle whose height is three times the base. So for instance, if I make a cut right here, right down, looking down on it, if I cut like that, I'm going to get a triangle, and this is the base of it, and the height is three times as high as that. So let me see if I can draw it in 3D a little bit here. So now that's the y-axis, and this is the x-axis. So our circle looks like this. Does that look like a semicircle? No. Try that again. Is that the right idea? This. A little better. Still not great. All right. So you see what I'm doing there? So that's now we now we're looking at. So it's actually the base. That's supposed to be the same semicircle that you're looking at at the left, and then. Uh, if we cut something like that right there, what are we going to get? We're going to get a triangle. Any way we slice it, we're going to get a triangle whose height is three times the base. So the very tallest triangle will be this one on the x-axis, right? Because that's going to be the, have the longest base. And then here we just come to a point, right? So those come to a point because there's no base there. So the, short, the, the smallest, shortest triangles are here at the top of the summit. Circular disk, and the largest ones are here. Does it make sense what we're doing? So then uh, you think of this as like a tile, like a triangular tile. It's got a little thickness to it, right? So what are we going to do? I trained you well enough yet. What are we going to do? Yeah. Right. Good. So we want the a typical element, right? A tip, we're going to find the volume of a typical triangle. And you said 1 half base times height, right? So that, tri that triangular thing is going to be 1 half base times height times the little thickness, which is what? Delta x or delta y? You should see that that's delta y. OK. And so now we need to, so I didn't specify what the radius is. So, it's, so we're just going to call it r. Right? So this works for any. So this is r comma 0. And this is 0 comma r. So now our answer is going to be in terms of capital R. Depending on how big the circular, the semicircular disk is, we'll give, we'll uh, result in how big our volume is. So our, uh, we just R is just like a number, like three or four, and we just just hold on to the capital R. It's actually uh, so it's a non-change. It's a letter we're using for a non-changing quantity in this situation. 
remember from you, you guys who had me in Calc 1, we call that a parameter. Parameter, it's a non-changing quantity until we change the situation, then it could change. But as long as we're doing this problem, R stays fixed. So that doesn't scare us. We, we're good with expressions and uh, just, you know, algebra of variables, no problem. All right, so then what is the base? The base then would be this right here, this dimension right here. 2R, is that right? Is that 2R? No, so R is only what? R is only the radius of the semicircular disk. So R is like from here to here or from here up to here. So any typical shell, what, sorry, sorry any typical tile, it's not going to be capital R, but what? I like the two, it's just not two capital R. What is it? Oh, and what's that? What's little r? X, right? It's x-coordinate. Again, x. To train yourself to ask this question. X, y, change in x, or change in y? So you could call that a change in x, or you could see that by symmetry, it's just two times x. Because this is x right here. Okay. So the base is going to be two times x. What's the height? Three times that, right? So it told us that someone could 6x. That's right. The height is going to be three times that. All right, three times 2x. That's a times, not a minus. Okay, so do you see what's going on here? And so now we got to get both these. we got to get x in terms of y. So how do we get x in terms of y? Sorry. Y, yeah, yeah, x in terms of y, that's right, x in terms of y. So we're talking about this semicircle right here. So what is, how can we get x in terms of y for our semicircle or this dot right here? Well, we have to know the relationship of x and y for that circle or semicircle. What's the relationship? So it's the equation of a circle, right? Equation of a circle. Oh, that's area. So be right. X minus a squared plus y minus b squared equals radius squared. But our center is at zero zero, so it's just x squared plus y squared plus r squared. So that's gives us all the points on that circle, and that's where we're getting this x from. And so then now we can solve for y and plug it in, and we got it. And we're done with that. Totally. Let me integrate that. Two times square root of what? R squared minus y squared. That's x, right? And then three times, two times that. Going for y. So there's our, that's the volume of our typical triangular tile, one half base, the base is 2x, the height is 3 times that, solve for y, okay, and then we can write, I usually do that, all that in red, so this is our setup, right, volume of a typical triangular tile, and so then the volume of the solid will be from what to what, so we got y, where's the first y value? 0, 2, capital R, and now we can simplify. 2's go away, this will be 6, and that thing squared is just, so just be 6 times capital R squared minus Y squared, dy. Okay. 2 over 2 is 1, 3 times 2 is 6, square root times square root is just what's inside. And then how do we treat this r squared? Just, it's, just think of it like a number, but you're holding on to the r, right? So what is the antiderivative of r squared dy? Six times antiderivative of r squared, capital R squared, dy. r squared, y, right? It's just like a number. It's just like a five or a two or a negative six, whatever. And then minus y cubed over 3, easy, from 0 up. Questions on that one?
Did you finish? Piece of paper from there. <coughs> Questions on how I did that? So you've got a web work that has like I think four of these different situations. You've different different uh, shape of the base, and then different tile shapes that are your stacking on top. So these are no longer by revolution, right? No longer by revolution, but we're stacking tiles. Question, anybody have a question? Okay, so then also you have some more written homework for Wednesday, and that's to derive some of our basic geometry formulas. So I'm just gonna just give you a little head start on the one where you have to derive the volume of a sphere, okay? So how can we derive the volume of a sphere? That's all the information I give you. I just say, figure out that the formula is 4 thirds pi r cubed, because that's the volume of a sphere. Well, you have to relate it to all these problems we've done. What is it that we've had to start with in all these problems to find these volumes of these solids? What's that? No, but what, no, what, what, what did you have before you started? What did you have before you started? Yeah, you had some curves or lines or, and regions, right? And then they told you what to do with that. So you have to come up with that yourself. So how, what, what kind of curves forming regions are we going to use and then either rotate or stack tiles in order to generate a spherical solid? Something to do with a circle. Two circles. We need two circles. Is that right? So what region, if we did something to it, would give us a solid? A solid sphere. Let's go back. So let's just look at the one we were just looking at, right? So, here's the circle, right? x squared plus y squared equals r squared. And we're trying to derive the volume of a sphere, which is pi 4 thirds pi r cubed. And remember, r is just the radius of the whole sphere, okay? So in this case, the radius of the semicircular disk. Okay, so that's your hint. You're going to take it from there. So now you have to come up with what are you going to do to generate the solid of a, this, a spherical solid? What are you going to do to generate a spherical solid? And then once you have once you have that set up, that strategy to get started, then it's just like every other problem. So the, the thing with deriving these formulas is you have to come up with the initial situation that's going to get you the solid that you want. Okay? So you have to imagine that and come up with that yourself. So I, I kind of gave you a start here. So what, what are you going to look at? What are you going to do? Like the things we've been doing that will generate a ball, a sphere. And then you're going to you do a cone as well. Okay, then you're going to do a cone, and that, so that's up to you. If you're going to have to do all that yourself. Come up with how you're going to set up curves and regions and whatever you're going to do so that if you stack something or rotate something, you're going to get a cone. Okay, any questions on that? That's your written homework for Wednesday. Okay, so we're done with volume. We're done with volume. Okay, so let's uh, move on to something else, but we're still on the same kind of theme here. Remember with our rate and quantity perspective? How would we fill in the boxes here with, uh, with written phrases or statements without looking at your notes if you, if you wrote this on another day. See if you can remember without looking at your notes. Discuss with the person next to you. 20 seconds, go. What would you put in these boxes?
OK, so the integral symbol means sum. We're summing up. What are we summing up? Are we summing up rates? Summing up rates of change? No, we're not summing up rates of change. Little bits of change. We sum up little bits of change. We get those little bits of change by the rate times a little change in x. Right? dx is part of the math. It's part of the math. You take the you take uh, a value of rate of change times a little bit of change, like uh, considering that rate to be constant over a little tiny interval. That's our f dx, right? F dx. We're not summing up rates. We're summing up small changes. Each change we find by a constant rate. Okay, and that equals. Net change, right? Overall net change in that quantity, right? If you sum up all the little changes, you get the overall net change, okay? Area. What are we summing up in the area perspective? What did we sum up in area perspective? Strips, right? Areas. We summed up areas of strips. We summed up thin strips of area. I, should, I really should say area, area of thin strips, right? We're not summing up the strips. We're summing up the areas. We're summing up the areas of thin strips. So I really should say area of thin strips to get. Yeah, well, so it would be net area from our, between our bounds or the area of the region that's defined by the bounds, right? So you could think of it as net area if, if you were integrating from infinity to negative infinity and you just wanted the area between your bounds, then it would be like net area, but... Total area of the region. And then volume perspective, summing up. Yeah, so uh, volumes of thin elements, right? Volumes of thin elements, whether those are pancakes, shells, washers, triangles, squares, piles, whatever. So it's like volumes of thin elements. Volumes of really thin elements. We saw all kinds, right? We saw several different kinds. And we get total volume, right? Total volume. Okay, so we're going to keep this theme going, and we're going to look at arc length perspective. Arc length perspective. Okay, so what we want in the end is we want the total length of an arc. Total length of an arc. What is it, what's our typical element going to be that we're going to sum up to get the total length of an arc? So we have an arc, right? Okay, and I want to find, say, the length of it from A to B. You can't, so with functions, we could define an infinitely many number of different curves with and shapes of arcs, right? So you can't go in the back of the geometry textbook and look up the length of this arc, right? So what are we going to do? We're going to sum up what? Well, so someone, I think someone said it. Was it? Okay, so what, what's the problem with a bunch of little arc lengths? Yeah, so to, to solve one little arc length, you had the exact same problem that, that we're starting with, right? So it's the right idea, but what is it that we can find the length of? Not, not arcs, but what is it that we can find the little length of that we're going to put all together? Linear segments, so little line segments, right? So by doing little tiny line segments, and I should, again, length of, I should be saying, this, we're not summing up the segments. We're summing up the length <coughs> of the line segments. Well, I should have had that instead. Change the slide. Okay? Length of tiny line segments. That, that we can find length much easier than an arc. So, but if there's length of arcs, then it's kind of like each one is the same problem we're starting with. What's the length of the arc? Well, that's what we wanted to know. All right, but line, line segments we can do. So I'm going to uh, kind of work through the, the proof of this, and it's a very manageable and doable proof at your, at your level, and so you'll be responsible for it on the exam. Either reproducing it, reproducing a part of it, or for sure understanding every part of it, okay? All right, so what does this thing look like? Here we go. So we got our picture here. 
so we have a function like this. Bigger. I know it's a race, so I'm just going to make it bigger. It's the whale function, okay? So here we go. And we want. Trying to be perfectionist, so this is going to be helpful. I need to, needs to be. Okay, that will help. Okay, and so we want the length of that arc from say A to B. So, what are we going to do? We know we're going to be summing up lots of little, like we said, uh, lengths of line segments. And so, what we first do is we're going to break up. Dot, dot. So we're gonna we're gonna partition. We're gonna break up that this uh, interval from A to B, and then in each little interval, what are we gonna do? We're going to we're gonna look at the points on the curve at the endpoints of those. Let me do this in blue so that. Shows up, and then where this is curved, we're going to. These are supposed to be line segments, so these are line segments now. Okay. So I'm joint. I found the points on the curve at the endpoints of our partition, partition intervals, and then I'm joining those points with little line segments. And so maybe this is the, uh, so I'll just say x1, so we'll have say x1, x2, x3, and then somewhere, this is just a typical one in the middle, it'd be like xi, okay? And intervals. Um, X sub i is the is the x coordinate for the ith interval. And so what we need to do is we need to get that little length right there. All right. And so we're going to call it delta s. Put it under, sorry. Delta S sub I. All right, so it's the, the length of the ith So there'd be like S1, delta S1, delta S2, delta S3 as we as we go across the curve, right? So like this first one would be delta S1, then we'd have delta S2, then delta S3, 4, etc. So then this is just any one, the ith one, okay? So how do we find the length of that? What is the length of that little <laughs> typical element, delta I, S, I? How are we going to get that? Does anyone see how we can do that? With what? Yeah, so... so Yes, if you thought something to do with a triangle, that's right. So this is kind of like the hypotenuse of a triangle. And then what are the legs of that triangle? So, okay, so do you see? He's right on. So that little segment we can think of as the hypotenuse of a little triangle whose legs are delta xi and delta yi. So therefore, delta SI equals, 
Anybody else? In here? How will we find that little length if that's that's the width of the i interval, and then that's the width of the of the height of the. Is that what we're gonna say? Square root of. So it's just right. Pythagorean theorem, right? Pythagorean theorem solving for the hypotenuse. Right? Always start with the typical element. So our typical element is a little line segment. Here's the length of the little line segment. We're, we're, out, we're not talking about area or volume anymore. We're talking about length. Length, right? So length, we're talking about the length of the hypotenuse of a little triangle for the i interval between A and B. Okay. And so then how are we going to approximate the whole curve length? This whole arc length. What will we do to approximate that whole arc length? We're not ready for integral yet. But yeah, that's the idea, right? But so what does integral mean? So what are we going to do? Sum. We're going to sum up all these little, and that's essentially what we're doing. So this is essentially what we want. We want the sum of all those little line segments. So this is, this is kind of like the answer, right? Well, what is that? That's the sum of. So we're going to go i from 1 to n, because there's n of them, right? So what it was this all should make perfect sense. Summing up a bunch of little hypotenuses of triangles. And each one of those is found by the Pythagorean theorem. Square root of leg squared one, or leg one squared plus leg two squared. So that, that should make perfect sense. Okay, but anticipating that things are gonna get small and we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have an integral eventually, this will become what? Dx, right? And this will become dy. So what's the problem with that? What do we really just, we want just what? We just want dx, right? We want to integrate from a to b. Those are x coordinates. So we need to do some little uh, trickery here to get, to get rid of this delta y, okay? So here's what we're going to do. I want to, I want to divide by delta y squared here to make this 1, okay? If I divide by delta y squared, I'm going to make that 1. But I need to maintain, the, maintain what this thing equals, okay, as I do that. So dividing this by delta y squared under the square root is like dividing by what outside the square root? Does this question make sense? So what do I want to do? I want to do, I want to do this. Got that squared. I want to, I want to divide by delta y i squared. But I want to, I'm going to maintain the equality. So then if I do it to this term, and there's a square root over this. So I've got to divide the whole thing by delta y i squared. Oh, it's the other way around, right? Sorry. I want to, I don't want to, yes, thank you. All right. I'm dividing by the wrong thing here. So, yes, we want to get rid of the delta y. Here, we're going to not divide by delta y, but by delta x. We'll see why in a second. That's, we want the 1 over here. Thank you. Okay. All right, so we can't just go around dividing things by something. We've got to maintain the equality of this. So by, we divided by uh, delta xi squared underneath the radical. 
So what can we do outside the radical to make up for that? Yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so we can multiply. And what would we multiply outside of the radical that would equal delta xi squared under the radical? Just a delta xi, right? Just a delta xi. Right? Because delta x, the square root of delta xi squared is just delta ix. Well, that's in the denominator. And then times 1 in the numerator maintains the equality of what we had above. So that's the, little, that's the trick that we have to do here. Is it okay? All right, so now this is what becomes 1, right? So we got sum of n equals 1 to infinity, or 1 to n. So that's 1. And then what do we have here? Delta y i over delta x squared. Okay, so there's our D, so this is, we're getting ready to think about an integral now. We're going to think about making n really large, so we have, so delta x is really small, right? So we're going to take lots and lots of intervals and make n really large, and then delta x gets really small so that it becomes dx, right? <clears throat> and then our summation becomes? So we know that thing is dx. We still have square root. One plus. Now the question is, delta y over delta x, when things become really small. In other words, what is the ratio of the change in y to the change in x as our interval gets really, really small? Ratio of the change in y to the change in x when things get really small. What is that ratio? It's really, it's like the most important question. It's, see, it's like this would be a great question to see if you got anything out of Calc 1. The ratio of the change in y to the change in x as it gets really small. Yeah, what's that called? Yeah, good, the derivative, right? The derivative. This is the derivative. But it's squared, right? That's rate of change. That's the rate of change of y with respect to x. How fast y changes with respect to x. Okay, so that gives us the arc length, right? So that, that gives us the arc length. Why? Because it's equal to, so this thing right here is essentially equal to what? A little teeny what? Line segment, hypotenuse of a little triangle, right? We just did a little bit of algebra to get it into a form that we can actually do antiderivative. We know we want that dx there. So this is what? It's still length of a tiny line segment. How about just the square root part? Is that the length of a tiny line segment? Just the square root part. No, right? This whole thing that I put a cloud around, that's what equals this hypotenuse. Without the dx, it's not the length of a tiny line segment. The dx is part of the math, just like we've been saying before. It's times dx, times dx, which is a little change in x. Without that little change in x multiplied on, that square root is something different. Okay. 
So it's with the times dx that it equals a small version of the hypotenuse of the, the length of the hypotenuse. Okay. <coughs> okay, so you have, and I'm going to uh, add one more web work, which will be this, but it's short. There's, there's nothing to do except apply this formula. Okay, so what is, so if we have this function here, this is y is a function of x, then what are you going to do? What is this right here? dy dx. It's the derivative, right? It's derivative. And so you learned how to do those in Calc 1. So the arc length, apply this formula, and that thing is the derivative. of the function in question. And then A to B is where you want to start measuring the length of the arc to where you're going to stop measuring the length of the arc. So for your for the, the web, web work, it's just like four questions. It's just about applying that formula. So we don't, I don't even have to do an example. Just read carefully, OK? But the, this proof is important. That's why I took the time to do it. Understanding where it comes from and what it means for the exam is also it's going to be important. Questions on that? Okay, so let's take a look at a second here. So the next uh, part of the course is some students think it's the hardest. So I'm just giving you a fair warning here. But it's actually really cool stuff. We're putting this to work in real world situations. Physics. So we have, or sorry, our exam is what, a week from Friday, so the Friday before spring break. So we've got we've got uh, four days and some change here to work on this stuff, and that's that's going to be a good good amount of time to work on this. Okay, um, we want to keep the same theme going, the same theme going as the mo the meaning of integral. Okay, it's the meaning of integral. So uh, before we start, let's. Um, Let's get some ground rules about physics here. So we're going to do kind of an overview of some physics quantities, their units, how it works. Um, so uh, we'll start with force and work. Force and work. Okay. Work is defined as force times distance. Force times distance. So the amount of work that you have to do is the amount of force you have to exert over a distance. And so, uh, so I've got the stool here. And I push it across this desk. I have to apply a force to it, right? And then I have to, if I want it all the way over here, I've got to push it across the distance, all right? So, uh, all right, so then Jacob, what if I put Jacob on the desk and I had to push him the same distance? Would that be more or less work? More because I need a greater force, right? I need a greater force, okay? And then if I wanted to push the stool, say, all the way to Ben, say the same one all the way to Ben, same amount of force to push it, but more distance, more work, right? It's going to take more work to do that. So that's why work is force times distance. And that seems easy, but what if force varies according to a function? What if force varies according to a function? So, uh, I don't know. So, say uh, when I'm pushing Jacob across the thing, he's uh, he's got a backpack with books, and as I'm pushing him, he's throwing books out of his backpack. Very <laughs> important example, right? Okay. So, what's going to happen to the force required as I'm pushing him? It's going to lessen, right? It's going to go down as I'm pushing him. So 
So now the force depends on where I am in my journey of pushing him. And so I can't just do force times distance because the force is changing. Force is variable, right? We'll see some, some actually more realistic examples of this. Okay. And so what is that going to mean for finding the total amount of work? How am I going to find the total amount of work now is, is if I push a little bit, suddenly the amount of force changes. And I push a little bit more and the force is different again. Right, and then it's going to be an integral. And how am I going to set that integral up? Okay, it's some, so yep, we're going to sum up what? Little bits of? No, we're not summing up force to get work. We're going to sum up little bits of work to get work, just like we've done all before, right? So if we wanted volume, we summed up little volumes. If we wanted area, we summed up little areas. So now if I want the total sum of a bunch of work, it's going to be, we're going to calculate a typical amount of work somewhere along the way. And we're going to sum up all the little bits of work it takes. And that will be the total work, or the net work, if you want. So just like with all our geometry, we're going to come to a situation and we're going to say, what, what is a typical amount of work among all the work I have to do? And we'll calculate that. And that, that's going to change. Right? That's going to change as we go as, as force varies across the distance. Right? If the force varies across the distance, then the, the little bit of work will vary across the distance. And we'll find the typical amount, and then we'll add them all up, just like we've been doing with the geometry. Okay, so uh, here's the deal. Let's talk about force and metric versus English. Metric versus English. So we're getting into these real world situations. We don't want to trip. We don't want to get tripped up with with units and which system we're in because they they kind of act a little differently. All right. So uh, force equals mass times acceleration. You've heard that. This is really primarily used just for metric units. Mass is in Grams or kilograms, right? And acceleration is in meters per second squared. Okay, we don't really see this in the English system, and we'll see why in a second. But in the in the metric system, we often calculate force as ma, ma, and then force is in newtons. Okay, force is in newtons. Okay, so now weight is a force. Weight is force. Whenever you talk about weight, that's the force of gravity on an object. So we still use mg, where g is the acceleration of gravity. Okay, so in the metric system, 9.8 meters per second squared. Every second, the speed increases by 9.8 meters per second or 32 feet per second squared. But for our purposes for calculating weight force, we're not going to really use this 32.2 feet per second squared. And we'll see why in a second, OK? But if you have the mass of an object and you want its weight, you multiply uh, you, the mass in, in kilograms, and you multiply by uh, 9.8, that will give you its weight, all right? Because weight is a type of force. And the measurement of weight in the metric system is newtons. It's not kilograms. Kilograms is mass. The amount of mass stays the same on the moon, in space, on the earth. But your weight changes. Your weight changes. OK? So, so yes, in, in everyday language, we talk about kilograms as weight. But in math class and in physics class, kilograms is not weight. It's the amount of stuff. It's mass. Weight is measured in newtons in the metric system. In English, it's pounds.
Okay, so here we go. Last thing in the English system, mass is usually not used. Okay, we don't multiply the mass times 32.2. We just are always given the weights. We're always just given pounds. All force values are given in pounds. So we don't really use mg in English units. So you won't really use this. So just last big important thing in these web work problems. If you're, if you're in the metric system, you'll often be given the mass. What do you have to do? To get the weight, you're going to multiply by 9.8. But in these lower problems, if you're in English units, you'll just be given pounds. That's already weight. There's no multiplying by G.